I always find it really interesting what students like to study internationally. I think it's something really important that you should do. Make sure it's something that you put on your resume, something that you talk about in interviews, because it shows a lot about you as an individual that you're willing to engage with broader cultures, expand your horizons, do different things with your, with your life. So I'm so excited to be here and see all these faces and see all of you that are taking risks with your careers and your futures and, and trying to broaden your horizons, do lots of different things. So I'm here to talk a little bit about international social media or how a social media campaign could go international. And when I took a look at the class list, I saw a lot of familiar names on that list. And I was like, ooh, there's people that took my social media class or took my InfoTech class. So I better come up with a new lecture for them or they'll just be bored to death. And they're like, I'm hearing Boris yell against about the same things over and over again because I took his InfoTech class or I took his social media class. So I put together a brand new international sport lecture for everyone. Um, let me give you a little bit of background about myself. I'll start with an anecdote to prove a larger point. So it's kind of like one of those TED Talks you, you watch where they start with a small story and then they use that to illuminate a larger issue or a larger point. So the story I'll tell you about myself is that I grew up in a very, very small town in upstate New York called Herkimer. Okay, it's on the New York State Thruway. You're from Utica? <laughs> awesome. Yep, Utica's right over here. So you may have heard of Utica, famous for their tomato pies and um, probably about it, maybe. <laughs> Utica College is there. Uh, but I grew up in a very small town. My graduating class had 89 students in it. Okay, those of you that are from downstate or Long Island, you probably had five times that in your graduating class, okay? So I grew up in a very small town. Everyone that I knew was a Yankees fan or a Mets fan. And the primary reason they were Yankees fans or Mets fans is that that was all that was on television. That was all that anybody talked about. But, like I said, just up the road from us was Utica, which kind of felt like New York City to me because it was so much bigger than Herkimer where I grew up. We had a, we had a local hero. His name was Mark Lemke. Okay? In the 1990s, he played second base for the Atlanta Braves. He just looks like a prototypical baseball player, right? Just looks like you look at that guy and you go, all oh, right, he must play baseball, right? Mark Lemke was from Utica. And the idea that someone 20 minutes up the road from me could play Major League Baseball was just like mind-blowing to me as a 10-year-old and as an 11-year-old. So that is how I became an Atlanta Braves fan. Again, like I said, he played second base for the Braves between, I think, like 1990 and 1996. He played for the Red Sox for a couple years after that. Still does play-by-play -play for the Atlanta Braves time, um, now and then. But like I said, grew up a Braves fan. It was very, 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 very hard for me to be an Atlanta Braves fan in the 1990s, okay? Of course, this is pre-internet, pre-social media. So, how did I get my information about the Atlanta Braves? Well, it was extremely, extremely difficult, as I've indicated already, okay? Think about it. How could you follow an out-of-market team in 1991, 1995? How could you get information if you wanted to root for a team outside New York? Newspaper? Would the local newspaper cover them? Probably not. Would the New York Times cover them? They might put their score in there. They might, might have a recap on a Sunday afternoon. Actually, one of my favorite things in my early life was visiting my grandmother in Massapequa because she actually got the New York Times and, the, and, the, and Newsday and I think the New York Daily News. And they would print the box scores. And I thought that was so cool. I could actually see what the batting average were batting averages were and how many home runs Barry Bonds had. How else might you be able to follow a team back in the 90s? Radio station. What? Radio. Radio? Yeah. Here's the thing though, 1990s, if I turned on the radio in Herkimer, New York, I got WFAN, maybe, down in the city. I got Yankee games, I got Mets games. It was very hard to get. I wasn't going to get in the Atlanta Braves game. Somebody else had their hand up. Before. I was going to say radio. What else? Word of mouth, that's something I'm going to get to. I didn't know a lot of other Atlanta Braves fans. Everyone I knew was a Yankees fan or a Mets fan because they grew up in New York State and it was easy to follow those teams. They were written about in the newspaper, they were on the radio, people talked about them. So 
<coughs> but long story short, it was very hard. Like if I don't wake up at the precise time at 6 o'clock before school, tune in the sports center and catch that 90 second clip when they talk about the Braves, I didn't know what was going on. I can remember sitting in my father's car being dropped off for school, insisting that we had to wait until the, until the scores were announced on the radio because I had to know who won the games the night before. But that's how I got my information. It's like, Dad, please, I don't need to go to school yet. I want to hear the scores come across the radio before I can go into the class and make fun of the Yankees fans who lost last night to the Red Sox, <laughs> right? Or I need to know if the Braves won and how Lemke did, okay? But it was extremely, extremely difficult. Like, if I didn't hit, hear that radio announcement, or if I didn't catch that 90-second recap of the game last night on Sports Center at a very particular time, it was very, very difficult for me to know much about that team, that organization. And this was really the age of local teams throughout the U.S. and the world. So if you put yourself in another country and you think about what media was like there, it was like back in the 90s, it was very similar. If you wanted to root for a team outside your geographic region, whether you're in the United States or England or Germany or Finland or whatever country you're in, it was very hard to get news about them because the local paper covered the local teams, radio was going to broadcast only the local signals, television was only going to have the local teams. Okay, And this is why for many, many years people just grew up rooting for local teams. It was just kind of hard to know about other teams. Right? Nobody was going to talk about them. Your friends weren't going to be fans of teams in California or teams in another country. Okay? So if you didn't root for the local team, it was nearly impossible to get information about teams outside your local media market. Okay? The newspaper didn't cover them. The radio didn't talk about them. They weren't on local pro television. And as I think Olivia mentioned, you didn't have a lot of other people to talk about them. With them. There weren't a lot of other Atlanta Braves running around Herkimer Middle School and Herkimer High School in the early 90s, late 90s. Okay? <coughs> so what does this have to do with our broader discussion here? Okay? What does this have to do with going from rooting about local teams to where we are today in 2018 with international social media and being able to root for any team anywhere? Well, I want to introduce you to this man. Does anyone know who this is? Probably 100% rate that everyone in this room has watched one of his cable networks within the last week. Anyone know who this is? This is another picture of him with his wife, Jane Fonda. Ted Turner? Yes, it's Ted Turner, founder of CNN, TBS, the T in there is for Turner Broadcasting Systems, TNT, the T and T, the T and TNT stands for Turner Network Television. Right? So he was a media pioneer, bought the Atlanta Braves, There's, as I mentioned, his wife Jane Fonda, the actress, bought the Atlanta Braves in the 70s. And he had this radical concept, there you go, you know, building CNN, he had this radical concept that, hey, you know, I, I own this sporting team, and I'm starting all these cable networks that are distributed not just in the United States, but throughout the world, and I need some programming for them. And what he decided to do was put the Braves on TBS. And they were aired on TBS for many, many years. Some of you may remember that I think they stopped airing their games pretty continuously in 2006. But he really understood that, hey, fans could come from anywhere. And TBS was a national, as it is now, it's a national station. Anybody can watch it in any state, any country. And the Braves really kind of became this international team or this team that anyone in any state in the union could root for them or learn about them. And you'll still find this today. You know, you'll find Braves fans in Florida, Braves fans in Idaho, Braves fans in North and South Dakota, maybe where they didn't have teams. But because they were aired on TBS and anybody could watch their games anytime, they could be accustomed and they could learn about the team and they could become fans of the team. So this was the primary reason that I was able to stay a Braves fan during the 90s, is because they were aired on TBS, because the owner of the team, Ted Turner, really understood that fans could come from anywhere. That fans could come from anywhere. Now it also helped, if you know your baseball history at all, that this Braves team during the 90, during the 90s was a fantastic team. Okay, they had Greg Maddox in their starting rotation, Tom Glavin, John Smoltz, Chipper Jones, they're all in the Hall of Fame now. So that helped a little bit, okay? And as I mentioned, this is kind of how I was able to stay a Braves fan in the 1990s, despite the fact 
that nobody talked about them in my local area and the local television, the local newspaper didn't cover them. Okay? So let's think about some other things about what the internet was like in the 1990s. All right? As the, internet, as the internet began to grow in the 1990s, of course, World Wide Web comes around in 1991, AOL, Prodigy, some of these early internet survive, or, <laughs> providers that you may have heard of, come around in the 1990s. And as they go online, and as we as Americans, or we as uh, an international culture start to go online, it became a little bit easier to root for a team or to become identified with a team that was outside your geographic market, okay? Because you had things like chat rooms. Chat rooms still exist. Anyone ever use a chat room? Anyone use a chat room? No? Okay. This is what we used to have back in the day. And Professor Mahoney's smiling because maybe she's familiar with them. Yeah? Of course. Yeah. Chat rooms. So I used to go on the AOL. You know, we're talking about 1995, 1996 here. And there used to be sports chat rooms. And it was so cool to talk with people about sports or about the Atlanta Braves or about the Miami Dolphins, who were my favorite football team because they had Dan Marino in the 1990s and he was my favorite player. But again, very hard to find a lot of Dolphins fans in Herkimer, New York, in upstate New York. Lots of Jets fans root for Kenny O'Brien and some of the old time Jets. But I could go online and I could find in chat rooms that were online, whether they be Dolphins fans or Braves fans or just people that want to talk about sports it became easier to connect with other people to share those experiences and talk about, hey, who's going to win the World Series this year? Hey, what do you think of the Braves pitching staff? Hey, what do you think of Dan Marino and his wide receivers this year? Is this finally the year where they're going to have a defense and Marino's going to win the Super Bowl? Of course, spoiler alert, he never does. All right? And then as the internet evolved, we got into the age of blogs. Now, most of you, unlike chat rooms, are probably at least familiar with the term blogs. You've read a blog, maybe you have your own blog. But this was a blog that I started reading about 1998, written by a friend of mine, Mac Thompson, who actually, um, Mac, um, a couple years ago, he had, he died of cancer. And I, I had never met him, but I had been reading his stuff for 15 years that I still get sad when I think about what happened to him. Even though I had never met this individual, we had talked online, I had been reading his blog. Um, Braves Journal, which has been around, like I said, for almost 20 years now. But again, this was a place where I could go and I could actually get Braves information. And I could actually find out, hey, what's the projections for next year? What are the new players that they sign? What are their profiles of those new players? What's the schedule look like? Who are their competitors? And they had things like comment sections, you know, kind of your forefathers of social media, where other Braves fans could talk to other Braves fans about the pitching staff, about exciting moments going on. They used to have things where you could have like a live conversation during the game, right? That's so exciting to actually talk to other people about the game while you're watching. It's something you couldn't do uh, because I didn't know a lot of other Braves fans, okay? And again, this kind of takes us right into the age of social media, okay? And while chat rooms and message, blo message boards and blogs and some of these early internet things allowed, a, allowed us to connect with other people that had similar interests, it really wasn't until social media came around in the middle of the last decade where it really exploded to the point where it is today. So in 2006, we have a really important tipping point when, when things change. Okay? Does anyone know what happened in 2006 if we're talking about the history of social media, the history of the internet that might have made things easier to communicate? Yes? Facebook. Yeah, well, what about Facebook? <laughs> Facebook started in 2004. <laughs> That's just a good answer in general. Like, if you have a social media question, you just go, Facebook. <laughs> right? It's a good answer. What, ha what did Facebook do in 2006? Was anybody able to sign up? Because at first it was only specifically for college students. Yes, yeah, so, yep, yeah, 2004, Facebook is only college students. 2006, they go, anybody can sign up, right? Facebook's, logo, or Facebook's uh, catchphrase is move fast and break things. And they moved really fast in 2006 to let anybody sign up. Okay? 2006, they only had 12 million users. Today, they have about 2.2 billion users. Okay? The largest country in the world. Or actually, I think China's higher, but pretty close there. 2007, they introduced this the newsfeed. So now it's really easy for us to share our thoughts 
connect with other people that have similar interests, talk about our favorite sports teams, complain about our favorite sports teams. Um, but yeah, 2006, Facebook gets out there. Within a couple years, 2007, we've got Twitter. 2011, we've got Instagram. 2012, we've got Snapchat. Okay? But 2006 is kind of that tipping point when Facebook opens to everyone and introduces the news feed. Okay? Which, I was making this comparison yesterday in my social media class, you know, you open up Twitter or you open up Facebook and you look at your news feed, it's kind of like the newspaper for your generation, right? It used to be my parents came home after a long day's work, they opened up the newspaper, they found out what was going on in sports or pop culture or celebrity gossip or the news, they read the newspaper, right? Your generation, and I'll, I'll include myself in that, Today, I want to find out what's going on in news, sports, politics, celebrity culture. I open up Twitter. I look at the trending topics. Or I pop open Facebook, and hopefully if there aren't too many Russian trolls on my Facebook page, I find out what's going on in news, politics, celebrity culture, and sports. Okay? So, in today's world, this brings us back to our ultimate point of this kind of anecdote story. In today's world, and you could probably put yourself, you can probably include yourself in this equation. If you want to root for a team in another country or also outside your local area, social media and the internet makes it incredibly easy for you to do that. How many of you are fans of, team, of teams or athletes that aren't even on this continent? Okay, about four, five, six, seven, eight hands. Nice. What makes that possible? Which, which of these social networks might you use to help make that possible? Yeah. Instagram and Twitter. Yeah, Instagram on Twitter. So if I want to be a fan of an athlete, where's Instagram? There it is. So if I want to be a fan of an English Premier League player or a player in Bundesliga or some international league, I can follow them on Instagram to find out more about that athlete <coughs> and uh, their personality and what they're doing. What about YouTube? YouTube make being a fan in today's world easier of rooting for a team outside of your local area? Oh, absolutely. I can go on and find highlights of any team in any market. How about Facebook, Twitter? If I want to follow a game in real time or an event in real time that's outside my country, can I use Twitter to do that? Oh, you better believe it. Most of you probably have, right? You know, maybe you follow the Olympics or the World Cup on Twitter. Maybe if you don't even have television, you can use some of these social medias to keep up the date on what's going on in the sports world with athletes, with teams that you're rooting for. Okay? So yeah, this is one of the primary takeaways that I want you to think about when we talk about international sport media today, is that social media has broken down all those barriers that existed for 200 years that kind of limited who you could root for. Right? Like I was saying, when I was growing up, everybody was a Mets fan or a Yankees fan, because that's all anybody talked about. That was all you, th those were the only teams you could get news about. In today's world, that's completely different. If you want to live in New York and be a fan of the Los Angeles Dodgers, A, I feel really bad for you because you just lost back-to-back -back World Series, but you can get lots of information about them from Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. If you want to live in New York and be a fan of a Brazilian soccer team or an English Premier team, I couldn't even comprehend the idea of doing that in the 1990s or in any time before that. But in today's world, you can go on YouTube and stream their games. You can find fans on Twitter. You can join a fan group on Facebook. You can follow their athletes on Instagram. Right? Now, you may have taken those ideas for granted, but it is why we really, it, it, it is an important point to keep in mind of why we live in such an exciting age and time where really, you can have a team in any city, in any country in the world, and you can generate fans anywhere because of social media. And that never existed before, going back 200 years to the beginning of Major League Baseball in the 1860s or 1870s, or the beginning of uh, English club soccer 200 years ago. Right? All those barriers of geography have pretty much evaporated. Okay? So, Let's talk about some other points that are related to that. The first one being that, as I mentioned, there are really no, because of social media, because of the internet, 
There are no geographical or limitations to the athletes you want to follow, the teams you want to follow, and the brands that you want to be engaged with or find more information about. So one of the points that I want to make here is how popular YouTube is. Okay? When we talk about social media, sometimes people, they forget about YouTube, right? They mention Facebook, or they mention Twitter, or they mention Snapchat and Instagram. After Google, which is the number one most visited website in the world, it's Facebook, which is number two. Number three in the world, YouTube, right? There's more videos streamed on YouTube every day than there is television content produced in the history of NBC, ABC, and CBS, okay? So YouTube, third most visited website in the world. And one of the things this really creates for brands that want to go international is it makes the distribution of their content a lot easier, okay? And I want to illustrate this with an example from a company that we all know, whether we live in the United States, Finland, Germany, or another country, is Nike, okay? Nike, probably one of the most international brands in the world, if not the most international brand. So this is one of their rather famous commercials from 1996. I remember they had this campaign that, hey, this commercial is going to air in 100 countries. It's going to air in 100 countries. And it's, a, it's if I remember correctly, it's a World Cup ad. Um, the 90, oh, I think that's 98 World Cup, actually. Think about the production value of how much this must have cost them. Nike in 1996 to air that commercial on television networks in a hundred countries, all right? Think about how many millions of dollars Nike must have invested in this campaign in 1996 to take their soccer commercial, the most international sports, and try to distribute it in a hundred countries, all right? There are, think about it, there are probably 50 versions of that ad in different languages, that's why you didn't hear a lot of language in that commercial because they wanted, to, they wanted the themes in there to be universal. But first of all, lots of production value in that commercial. And then the cost to distribute that to 100 countries, there are different regulations for television, different television stations paying for it, all that. What do they want to do? What can they do today if they have a really clever ad? Do they distribute it in 100 countries? Do they pay 100 different television stations to distribute their ads? What can they do today? Throw it on YouTube. Throw it on YouTube, right? So here's their commercial from 2010 from, for the World Cup that they put on YouTube. They didn't pay a cent for distribution. All of it went to production. So you may remember this ad from um, the World Cup a couple years ago.
Again, they're appealing to a very international audience. Lots of different languages, lots of different players in here. You also notice that they're using kind of social media to watch some of the events. Social media is really integrated in this ad. Again, think about how much money they spent on that one. But again, in today's world, they can just put that on YouTube. They can clip out a 60 second clip for a bit and put it on Instagram. They can put it on their Facebook page and people will share it organically just because they think it's a cool ad and it's got all these neat ideas about, hey, what goes through the player's mind in those you know, life changing moments when they're in the World Cup where if they score a goal they're going to be celebrated and their dance will be copied and they'll have statues built about them and then what happens if they fail they'll become the GOAT and you know, um, you know, people will uh, think negatively of them. I love that commercial because it also shows like integration of social media how like a moment can happen in an international sporting like, event like that and then all of a sudden everyone's talking about it. It's referenced on social media. NBA players are copying the dance. There's a reference on The Simpsons or something like that. If you'll notice, the only words in that commercial are from Homer Simpson. So I guess Homer Simpson's dough is part of the international language now that everyone understands what that means. Um, but as a result of what social media is today, every team, league, and company has to really think about their international brand and how they can be presented to an international audience. Okay, and This is more true of some teams than others. Some teams might have a more international presence than others. And let's talk about an example of this, um, uh, learning from our experts, okay? So this is Courtney Hoekstra. She is the social media coordinator of the Cleveland Cavaliers. She's spoken to my social media class a few times, and one of the most interesting things that she always brings up is when is the busiest time for, think about this, when do you think is the busiest time for the Cavs social media. I had to put that little caveat of was in there because I'm pretty sure her job is a little different now that LeBron James is not on her friend is not part of her franchise. What do you think is the busiest time for her and her social media team? Yes. Either before or after the game. Either before or after the game. Yeah, good guess. 
Any other? Yes? Draft. What? Draft. The NBA draft? Yeah. Sure. Especially this year, they were looking for uh, they were looking for a new point guard or someone to replace LeBron. Good thoughts. And oh, Stefan. When LeBron's on the court. When LeBron is what? On the court. On the court. Yeah, he's definitely probably got lots of traffic when LeBron was there. Olivia. The off season. The off season. Okay. Really good guesses. Really good guesses. But the actually the busiest time is 3 a.m. to 8 a.m. Because that's when the Korean, Japanese, and Chinese audience, which loves LeBron, is on social media. All right? How many people are in China? About two and a half billion. And they love LeBron. Okay? So the busiest time for her and her social media team, when they saw the most traffic, was 3 a.m. to 8 a.m. Not normally the time where we're in front of our computers thinking about social media updates. Okay? So her team had to be very cognizant and think a lot about when we post updates. They couldn't go quiet in the middle of the night, whereas most social media is kind of maybe shut down between after game time and maybe the next morning. For an international team like the Cavs or the Yankees or the Los Angeles Lakers or any team that's represented in other countries around the world, some of your most active times when the most people are looking at your content might be the middle of the night for you. Okay, so her team had to think about, okay, let's have some updates that are ready to go at 3 a.m. Let's have an update that's ready at 4.30. Let's be ready to interact with people at 6 o'clock if they're asking questions or they're bringing up content. Like, we need to schedule stuff. We need to have people that are on our social media ready to update it at those hours just because the Asian audience is so incredibly massive. All right? And think about it, the more international a brand is, the more cognizant that you have to be of that international audience and when they're awake, when they're checking your things, when they're expecting updates, okay? So I kind of have this uh, point here. She made this point when she spoke to my class that her job is 24-7, 365, because you cannot have kind of a, you cannot have an ethnocentric point of view for social media. You cannot think only people in Cleveland are checking your social media, right? You can't be on their clock. You have to be on the world's clock. Hey, people in China are reading. People in Russia are reading. When does the UK wake up? When does Finland wake up? When does Germany wake up? When are they checking their social media at night? Are they checking it when they get home from dinner? What's that time like in their, in their country, okay? So this is true of just about any international brand. So think about a European soccer team that has to be ready with updates for when the American audience wakes up or when the American audience starts checking their social media more heavily in the evening. They have to be ready for updates for you at 6 p.m. even though it might be midnight in England. Or they have to be ready with you for updates at 6, 7, 8 p.m. in the evening if you're a German soccer team even though it's 2 a.m. in the morning in Germany. And vice versa, right? U.S. teams have to be thinking about if I'm the New York Yankees, yes, I might have a game at 7 o'clock in the evening, but what time is it in England at 7 o'clock here? It's like midnight, right? So they may not know until the next morning. So you have to have updates that might be ready for them at 7, 8 a.m. their time, even though it's 